Since the rocket age first took off during World War II, choosing the right fuel has always been a hot topic among scientists. Back then, rockets ran on things like ethyl alcohol, kerosene, or, in more advanced cases, liquid hydrogen. Sure, they worked, but they came with major downsides. Pollution, inefficiency, and worst of all, they weren't suitable for the long journey. That's why SpaceX is believed to be leading the charge with a whole new kind of rocket fuel. The propellant used in Starship isn't just different from what we've seen in the past. It's a game changer in terms of performance, efficiency, and cost. More notably, SpaceX itself even has an ASU fuel production project that has already been approved. So what exactly makes this new fuel so special? And why is it considered a key ingredient for reaching Mars someday? Let's dive into today's episode of Alpha Tech. During World War II, under the direction of German scientist Werner von Braun, Nazi Germany developed the A-4, the first true rocket in history. It made its first successful flight on October 3, 1942, and became the world's first liquid-fueled ballistic missile. The A-4 ran on a mix of ethyl alcohol, essentially diluted alcohol, and liquid oxygen, a type of oxidizer that's still used today in many modern rockets, including SpaceX's Starship. With a range of about 320 kilometers and a peak altitude of 80 to 100 kilometers, the A-4 was the first human-made object to cross the Karman line, the official boundary of space. There were several practical, technical, and economic reasons why Dr. Werner von Braun and his team chose ethyl alcohol as the main fuel for the A-4 rocket during World War II. First, ethyl alcohol was relatively easy to produce and widely available in Germany at the time. It could be distilled from potatoes or other plant sources, helping reduce dependence on scarce wartime resources. When combined with liquid oxygen as the oxidizer, it created a stable combustion reaction, providing enough thrust to power the A4 to a range of several hundred kilometers, with a specific impulse of around 250 seconds. Second, although there were alternative fuels at the time, like kerosene, it hadn't yet been refined into the high-grade RP1 we use today. And while liquid hydrogen had been discovered and experimented with as early as 1898 by British physicist James Dewar, large-scale production and safe storage were far too complex for the 1940s. In contrast, ethyl alcohol was far easier to handle and store under the technological conditions of wartime Germany, especially when rockets had to be mass-produced under extreme pressure. Despite its early advantages, ethyl alcohol was soon replaced after the war by a more advanced fuel, RP-1, a highly refined form of kerosene. RP-1 offered a higher specific impulse, around 280 to 310 seconds, compared to just about 250 for ethanol, which meant better performance and greater payload capacity. It also had a higher energy density, allowing for more compact fuel tanks and lighter rocket designs. Another key benefit was storage. RP-1 has a high boiling point, around 217 degrees Celsius, so it didn't require the deep cryogenic cooling needed for liquid hydrogen or methane, making handling easier and cheaper. By the 1950s, the U.S. and Soviet Union had steady oil supplies, allowing them to refine RP-1 at scale. Its clean combustion and low impurities made it ideal for rockets like Atlas, Redstone, and the Soviet R-7. As space missions grew more demanding, from launching satellites to reaching the moon, RP-1 became the industry standard for first-stage propulsion. Even today, RP-1 powers SpaceX's Falcon 9, with over 500 successful launches. But for the next generation of rockets, especially one designed to be fully reusable and go to Mars, RP-1 just isn't enough. So, why did SpaceX choose liquid methane for its Raptor engines? What makes it better than hydrogen or RP-1? The answer is surprisingly simple. Efficiency. For any rocket, the dry mass, meaning the total weight of the vehicle without fuel, typically makes up only a small fraction of its fully fueled weight, usually somewhere between 5% and 25%. Take the Space Shuttle, for example. If we count just the orbiter and the two solid rocket boosters, and not the massive external fuel tank, its dry mass was about 165,000 kilograms. When fully fueled, the entire system weighed around 2 million kilograms, putting its dry mass ratio at roughly 8.3%. Starship takes this even further, 
Fully fueled, the combined weight of both stages is around 5,000 tons, but its dry mass is only about 290 tons, just 5.8%. That's incredibly lean for such a massive launch system. So, why do rockets carry so much fuel? They need an enormous amount of propellant to generate enough thrust to lift such a large vehicle through Earth's thick atmosphere and escape the pull of gravity to reach orbit. Of course, having more fuel is good, but raw quantity isn't everything. To truly optimize a rocket's performance, you need specific impulse, or ISP, a measure of how efficiently your engine turns fuel into thrust. Think of it like a car's miles per gallon. The higher the ISP, the farther you can go with the same amount of fuel. That's one of the key reasons SpaceX switched to liquid methane. It can deliver a specific impulse of up to approximately 380 seconds in vacuum, while RP-1 only manages around 300 seconds. That's a big difference. With the same amount of fuel, a methane-powered rocket like Starship could theoretically reach the moon, but if it were running on RP-1, it might only make it about three-quarters of the way there. Many people might wonder, if SpaceX switched to liquid methane over RP-1 because of its higher specific impulse, then why not go all the way and use liquid hydrogen? After all, hydrogen offers the highest specific impulse of any rocket fuel, up to 450 to 465 seconds in vacuum, which is a huge leap in performance. But the answer lies in SpaceX's ultimate goal, Mars. Between liquid hydrogen and liquid methane, methane is clearly the more practical option for missions to the Red Planet. For one, the ingredients to make methane are already available on Mars. Thanks to a chemical process called the Sabatier reaction, methane can be produced directly on Mars by combining CO2 from the Martian atmosphere, which makes up about 95% of it, with hydrogen extracted from subsurface ice. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is much harder to deal with. To use it as fuel, you'd need to extract water, split it via electrolysis, and then cool the hydrogen all the way down to minus 253 degrees Celsius, an extremely low temperature that's hard to maintain for long periods in Mars's harsh and fluctuating environment. Methane, by comparison, only needs to be cooled to negative 161 degrees Celsius. It's far easier to store and handle. It evaporates more slowly, is easier to insulate, and is less prone to leakage than hydrogen. All of this makes methane a much more viable fuel for long-term Mars missions, not just to get there, but to launch back from the Martian surface. And that's why SpaceX chose it. Next, let's talk about combustion temperatures. Cooler burning fuels are generally easier on rocket engines and can help extend engine lifespan over time. RP-1 burns the hottest, reaching temperatures of around 3,397 degrees Celsius. Liquid hydrogen burns cooler at approximately 3,097 degrees Celsius. And in case you haven't guessed, methane falls right in between, burning at about 3,277 degrees Celsius. Now, let's shift to another thermal factor, boiling point, the temperature at which each fuel turns from liquid to gas. Since rocket fuels need to stay in liquid form to maintain high density and be easily managed, a higher boiling point makes storage and handling much easier. Fuels with higher boiling points require less insulation to prevent boil-off, and less insulation means lighter tanks, which is always a plus for rockets. Because methane and LOX have similar storage temperatures, they can be housed in adjacent tanks with a common bulkhead, simplifying vehicle design and saving mass. In contrast, hydrogen and LOX have such different temperatures that storing them side by side becomes a major challenge. LOX would boil the hydrogen, and hydrogen could actually freeze the LOX. Speaking of LOX, there's been a huge development. SpaceX has just secured permission to build its own liquid oxygen production plant, right near the South Texas launch site. More specifically, Cameron County has officially approved SpaceX's plan to construct an air separation unit just 300 feet from the local sand dunes. This facility will function much like a small refinery, pulling in atmospheric air and separating it into its core components for rocket operations. The plant will sit on a 1.66-acre plot, about 1.25 times the size of a standard football field, and will include 20 different structures, most notably a 47-meter tall tower, roughly the height of a 15-story building. The tower will be built around 85 meters inland from the vegetation line at the edge of the dunes. Using this new plant, 
SpaceX will separate air into liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen. LOX is used as oxidizer for rocket fuel, while liquid nitrogen is essential for engine testing and general operations. With this facility, SpaceX hopes to eliminate the need to truck in fuel from nearby Brownsville. Currently, the company says it needs over 200 tanker trucks of LOX and LN2 per launch, which costs between $700,000 and $900,000, not to mention the temporary traffic congestion it causes along Highway 4. That's according to a SpaceX engineer who spoke at a county meeting just last week. To put things into perspective, 1.66 acres is relatively small compared to large-scale ASU facilities, like Air Liquide's plant in South Africa, which produces up to 5,000 tons per day of liquid oxygen. A facility on this footprint would likely fall into the medium or small-scale category, more in line with industrial or medical-grade production needs rather than massive national supply. In terms of output, mid-sized air separation units typically produce anywhere from 150 to 1,000 tons of LOX per day, depending on their design and technology. Assuming SpaceX's plant lands somewhere in the middle, say around 500 tons per day, that would equate to roughly 438,000 liters of liquid oxygen produced daily. Even after factoring in electricity usage and other operational costs, the economic and logistical advantages are clear. Instead of relying on hundreds of fuel deliveries from outside sources, SpaceX would be generating its own oxidizer right on site, faster, cheaper, and more sustainably. But as promising as that sounds, there's also a real possibility that SpaceX might abandon plans to build its own ASU at Starbase due to a lack of sufficient on-site electrical power and other practical limitations.